Hey folks, welcome to Test in Production. We are super excited to have you here. I give really high odds that I fall in that crack and fall off the stage, which is um, usually my, my standard for did a talk succeed? Did I fall off the stage? No, talk succeeded, excellent. So I'm not the one giving a talk today. We have three exciting speakers who are gonna talk to you about different aspects of testing in production, and I'm really happy to introduce them to you. So uh, before I start, I need to say thank you to the Microsoft Reactor for hosting us. We really appreciate the space. Uh, LaunchDarkly is sponsoring this, but this is a meetup for the community and not just for LaunchDarkly. So our first speaker, are you ready, Craig? There he is. Our first speaker is Craig from Humio, thank you. And uh, he's going to talk to us about how Humio tests in production, eating your own dog food without even knowing it. So I'm really looking forward to hearing this. Let's give him a little round of applause. All right, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Make sure I turn this thing on. You're good. All right, thank you. All right, so um, first a confession. I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm just going to admit that. So the product of this presentation really comes out of conversations with my entire team, but uh, two people really stand out, um, Thomas and Morton, who are core engineers who were back way back in the beginning in the Humio product, which was so two and a half years ago, really a long time in internet years. Uh, these guys um, really know what they're doing, and they help me a lot with this presentation, so I just wanted to admit that. Um, just quickly, Humio is a log aggregation platform. So the job of Humio is to take all of your log data and make it somehow meaningful to you. And I just want to explain that in the terms of when we're testing in production, it's all about you know, delivering a better product. It's, this presentation isn't really about selling you on Humio. It's telling you how we test Humio to sell it to you. Um, so when I started thinking about this presentation, I went to the team and I asked them, how do we test in production? And there were a lot of blank faces. And they said, wait a second, do we test in production? And they're like, I guess when you put it that way, we do. And so this is gonna be a little bit of a talk about how we also discovered how we're actually using our own product to test our product in production. Uh, and also for those of you who are not in the kind of space where you have millions of users to do feature flag A, B type testing, I'll tell you about how we do it, because we actually are pretty small. Um, our product, although we do have a hosted version, um, we primarily focus on selling software to customers who host it in their own infrastructure, and when you do that, it's really hard to test in production because they don't like you to look over their shoulders when they're running your system in their, in their environment. But we do have hosted customers. It's just a very small number, so we don't have millions of users and we can't, like, do A-B testing and generate large volumes of data, but we do absolutely test features in production. Um, and when we talk about production, for Humio, there's levels of production. Uh, so every developer obviously has their own environment when they're releasing their engineering code and through the pipeline. Um, but then we have this system called ops.humio.com. That's where we actually monitor all of the Humio clusters that we're running somewhere, whether it's for customers or our cloud infrastructure. And that's kind of our first line of testing and production. Because that system is super important to our daily business, but that's the first place that really gets all of our new features. So it's our system, and if it goes down, it's a big problem for us because <laughs> then we have no idea what's happening with all our other systems that are out there. Um, yet we still do test in production on that, and some days it's a little hair raising. Uh, but the nice thing to note is if it ever were to completely fail, we might lose um, many, many, many terabytes of data, but we wouldn't actually go out of business. We would just have a blind spot for a few days. Uh, if it passes in that environment, that's usually when we do one of two things we'll cut a release candidate that we might give to customers that are running on premise that we trust and like to live on the edge, um, specifically those who may have asked for a new feature that was in that release. 
The other thing we do is we might release it to cloud.hemio, and that's where um, our customers who are on the hosted environment live. Uh, sometimes we do it and let them know that there are features that they're getting that didn't exist before, and other times we just wait to see how they respond. <laughs> and whether or not they notice they got some new features. Um, and then obviously we go to release, and then in release that could be direct to on-prem, et cetera. So. Um, but because we don't have a lot of users in that cloud environment, we don't do A, B feature flag type of testing in an automated way, and we don't sit and study data about it. But we do have a couple of cool features, and in fact, this even works for on-premises customers, um, we do feature flags and we build them into our UI. So, little secret trick, if you do control shift F, it'll open the panel on the left. And that'll give you a list of all the things that we're currently testing in the UI side of things. And you can actually try them out for yourself. Um, I took this snapshot, uh, this screenshot a couple of weeks ago. Uh, some of those things don't actually work. So like if you were to hit dark syntax theme, nothing would happen. We tested the dark theme, nobody liked it, and it was disabled, and we just haven't removed it from that control panel. Um, the other interesting thing we do is if you hit control shift D, and again, if you're having to try Humio, you can try this yourself, you'll get this dev panel. It's another undocumented feature. But what it actually allows us to do is watch the real-time execution of queries that people are running and see what's happening. And that's really powerful for us because when we release this platform, we can't always anticipate edge cases. We don't know what people are actually going to do. We have a guide that says, here's how you write a query to query your data. But we don't really know at the end of the day like how a power user like you might write that query and what would actually happen to the system. So we put a profiler in, and if you hit that control shift D, that'll come up and you can actually watch your queries executing and how, it's, uh, the, how the profiler is dealing with them. So that's kind of fun. So that's how we're doing testing on the UI side of things. It's not um, a huge scaling feature, but it's something that you can do on your end if you don't have millions of users, but you want to try things out in a kind of a production environment and give your customers that ability to say, oh, yeah, I want to try that dark theme. Let me try that out, um, as long as you're letting them know. And you, know, you can still slip things in on them. So now here's where we talk about data. So we are a data platform, and we're designed to ingest very large volumes of data, um, up to hundreds of terabytes a day. Uh, so the benefit is on the back end, we can really use our platform to test how our platform is doing at, at doing what we want it to do, ingesting all that data. Uh, and here's an example. So one of the features is that you can archive your data off of the platform to an S3 bucket. And at one point, it was kind of limited to 2.3 terabytes a day. And so the engineer who worked on this feature said, how can I improve that? And one of the things that we have in the platform, which is written in Scala and runs on the JVM, is that we're doing thread dumps. So if you go into Humio, you actually can see that there's a constant update in, the, in Humio of thread dumps coming from Humio itself. So Humio is monitoring Humio. And in this screenshot, what you see is a thread dump specifically for the S3 archiving job and for the segment source class that's handling those features that are archiving data. So you took a look at what the thread dump was saying, and this is really important. So if you're gonna do this, and I highly recommend any application you write has this capability of doing this kind of thread dump so you can watch your app in real time. The only problem is you really need to understand your app to understand what the thread dumps are telling you. So it's important to name functions and classes something that makes sense to you, because otherwise your thread dump data is pretty useless, right? So fortunately, this engineer, having written the code and named everything, understood what these thread dumps were telling him, and figured out that the, uh, the bottom four minus the last one actually were meaningful. And so he went back and worked specifically on those functions and was able to get it up to 3.3 terabytes a day. And 
we can monitor that because after he put that code into production, on the left-hand side, you can see right in the middle of the graph, the um, throughput went up. Now, the right-hand side is CPU. Like you want to increase throughput, but you don't want to increase CPU utilization. Um, ignoring the spikes, which are unrelated to the code he released, you can see that CPU utilization was kind of straight across the board. So that's a classic example of build your application so that you can actually monitor the application and see what's happening with it. Um, and we do that on the cloud version as well in release because one of the things you find is just because it works for you on your machine doesn't mean it will continue to work when you give it to customers. So it's really important to, to make sure that goes throughout the whole life cycle. Uh, another example, uh, we compress data as it comes in. And so we're continuously working on trying to improve that level of compression so we can get more data stored in the same amount of space. And we wrote a new algorithm, dropped the algorithm, and you can see we monitor the level of compression we get, the overall. And uh, at just after 12 o'clock on the 27th of August, we released that new code, and you can see the compression doubled. So that, Another great example of being able to monitor. It's not just the thread dumps, now it's the actual output of the product and how much stuff is getting compressed. Um, so big, just a, that, you know, if I'm gonna leave you with a takeaway, is build your application to actually make it observable. So that goes back to like just basic observability principles and it's not even, you know, like, I want to know all the things. It's start to think about it like, what do my users care about? And in our case, they care about like, how much data can I get out? How much data can I get in? And then how can I monitor that? Or how can I just watch the entire life cycle of the application so that I can actually see you know, what's happening once I've released it into production? And as a developer, <laughs> remember, just because it works on your machine doesn't mean it's gonna work in production. So like customers always find interesting and new ways to break whatever it is you release to them. There's always some edge case you haven't anticipated. So as long as you can watch these things happen throughout the full life cycle, then you're gonna hopefully be able to give them um, what they need in the long term and they'll buy your product. Uh, if you wanna know more about that last part, uh, when I started talking to Morton about this and I said, testing in production, Morton said, oh my God, that's a really good idea for a blog post. And he went and wrote a blog post about all of this stuff. So um, it's really interesting. And um, although you probably don't want to remember that bitly, if you just go to the Humio blog, you'll find it out there. Um, so thank you. That's my talk, and hopefully, like, if you have any questions, feel free, um, you know, now. I think there's a couple of minutes or after. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. Uh, all right, first of all, first question, are you hiring? So we absolutely are hiring, uh, and I will tell you the, the big selling point is we are a, a Danish company. We were founded in Denmark out of the city of Aarhus, and so we're really big on Hygge. Um, if you know anything about Scandinavian culture, that means we're really nice and we like candles and warm, like, fuzzy stuff. Uh, Cozy sweaters as yeah, a culture. It's, and it's, uh, it's, it's always worth a good trip. We, I just came back from an engineering meetup in Sweden, which was amazing. Um, and I've been to Aarhus, so, like, big selling point. You get to travel internationally and build really cool software. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. Round of applause for Craig. Thanks. Wait, don't go away. Craig, you're not off the hook yet. People have questions? And you mentioned uh, when you build an app, you should make sure that the app is observable. Do you have any more examples? When you can you elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, well, so uh, a couple of things about observability. I mean, you have to think about the entire life cycle. It, it's not just the end users, but if there are other applications that are looking to receive data, you know, think about your users, whatever is consuming the product of that application. Um, from a, just an engineering perspective, it's being able to do things like thread dumps um, so that you can just monitor everything that happens. But if you're gonna do that, again, remember, naming conventions matter because six months from now, you won't remember what that function did if it's not really obvious, right? 
Uh, so make sure that when you're looking at those thread dumps, you're writing data that's meaningful. So you can actually understand where the errors are happening or where things are like sitting, waiting, idle for work to be done. Um, the other thing is, uh, as far as errors, if you're gonna output errors, same thing. Don't just say error. Like, you need to give some context around the error so whoever's gonna be dealing with the error can, is not spending an hour trying to figure out how to remediate. You know, tell them how to remediate. Like, if this is happening, Clearly, this has happened, and you should do this to fix it, right? So it's just, you know, observability is about making sure you understand what's going on, and when things break, that you can fix them quicker. Uh, especially at scale, when these things get big, it's just really hard to, you know, understand all the moving pieces. And when you have a big team of engineers, you know, you start to have specialists, and not everyone will understand what's happening on the other side of the, of the, the wall, so to speak. Any other questions? Well, you'll be able to find him when we take a break. But thank you, Craig. Thank you.